welcome to the Human Project. Um, I'm still here in Armenia. I'm overlooking uh, Cherewan, which is the capital of Armenia. And I had the big pleasure to jump into Isabel rather by coincidence. As it happened, I was looking for a certain museum here in Cherewan. And I asked a woman who was just randomly passing by. We started to talk and she said, wow, her husband... He's German. German Armenian. German yeah. Armenian, right? Or and again, I said, oh, wow. And uh, we exchanged numbers, a conversation started. And out of that contact, I learned to know Isabel, with whom I'm right now staying here in Cherwan. Welcome. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have you here at our spot <laughs> to welcome you and to yeah, maybe chat a little about wine, the main topic that drives us crazy here. <laughs> and us is you, Isabel, and is your, is your husband. Yep. And you have been both living here, correct me if I'm wrong, for a bit more than five years with your two sons? A bit more than four years. We four years, close to 17. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we started here in 2017. Me in April and my family came then in August. So I started without them. Here in that beautiful but very challenging country. <laughs> <laughs> and we spoke this morning how difficult it is even to access Armenia because there is no non-stop flight possible to go into this country of the Caucasus. So your speciality is wine. How does it come that you are in love with wine? Because yesterday night we had beautiful wine. You were talking about wine. You really went so much into depth that even words were used I never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I must admit that my parents are really or were really big French lovers, France lovers, and uh, they were both French teachers. And so I grew half partially up in France. And uh, my father-in-law was French as well. And he kind of showed me how to drink wine, how to enjoy wine, how to, how to celebrate it. And uh, yeah, even though I grew up in Berlin, and it's not really typical capital for winemaking. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, yeah, after I have tried to study Japanology, I decided, okay, maybe it's not the right way for me. And we were thinking family-wise, like what would be nice to have in our family? And we came once more up with this wine idea. So what would be nice to have within the family? Yeah, like, okay, some guys like you who are like professional in all kind of lawyer stuff or someone like physiotherapist, for example. But also we came up with this wine idea. Also, oh, you were looking around what kind of family members you have who were already occupying a certain profession. Uh, and then you came to a oh, wine. There is nothing. Uh, no, they are all teachers in my family. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided, okay, I don't want to be a teacher at all. <coughs> Okay, it's not always running in the way that you expect when you are younger. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so yeah, we were thinking about wine and I was like, okay, wine connects, like you can do it everywhere in the world. Wherever wine grows, it's nice climate wise. The people are open and friendly. And also, uh, th th you have, you have Let a really... Let me get back into that. This is really <laughs> great to have <laughs> criteria like this because I was not thinking about when I started to study uh, law, how it is to really be in-house, into an office, to mm -hmm. work in front of a computer, you know? Yeah. And so you were thinking about, oh, wine, nice areas, it's international, yeah. you have people that are chilled, yeah. actually, right? <laughs> so you imagined your environment in which you would work later in. Kind of, yeah, because I said, okay, it's, it's like everywhere, all the nice climates have wine, that's nice, so it is very international. You have like from from nursery for wine crafting issues, you can start by that. You can work also like, of course, like a professor at the university, if you like that. You can be like a journalist and, and, and write articles about that. You can make wine, of course. You can sell wine. You can have wine tastings. You can do everything with and around wine. And that was so attracting. And that's why I decided, okay, I should move and go from, yeah, leave Berlin. So I moved into that area. Because it was not possible to, to me, study in, in, in it there, there, right? No, beer, beer brewing is possible. <laughs> wine making is not possible at all. <laughs> at that time, it was only Geisenheim, the only solution that we had during, uh, yeah, when I started. So where did you go then? You left Berlin and you went to? Um, area Rheingau, so not too far away from Frankfurt, next to Wiesbaden Mines. So beautiful Rhine River, really amazing region. 
Uh, the only un in inconvenience for me was that they they are growing uh, growing Riesling over there, and I grew up with French wines, so without <laughs> almost no acidity. What a burden! <laughs> yeah, no, really, like it was really a huge shock. I mean, sounds maybe now looking back a little crazy, but the first experience with Riesling, and I was so shocked about the high acidity they had. I mean, now I'm really in love about that, but at that time, just knowing French wines. Uh, it's a different piece of cake, let's say. <laughs> yeah, but I got, I got used to doing Riesling. And so, uh, yeah, 1996, I moved from Berlin to the Rheingau area for first having apprenticeship one year and then starting studying at Geisenheim University. Mm -hmm. so. And now, years after, you find yourself here in Jerewan. We are sitting here on your Hollywood swing where you're <laughs> so enjoying weird. yesterday night already. <laughs> And now you just like served an amazing breakfast. And let me just bring this in. Um, as we have touched the subject, I was so pleased because I came here. You said, just come over. You can stay over the night. We never met in person actually before. We just uh, chatted. chatted <laughs> yeah. And said, oh, wow, this is so non-German, this kind of open house atmosphere. And you said, yeah, this is what I was used to, uh, to when growing up with my parents. It's not very usual for the Germans to do that. But I enjoy and I love it. And so we are now here sitting uh, in this Hollywood, on this Hollywood swing, overlooking Cherevan. Tell me, why are you here? What brought you here and to what extent is it linked to your fascination about wine? Okay, like sometimes uh, destiny... Uh, kind of slaps you full in your face when you are not thinking about it. So it was like my husband is also involved in wine and winemaking. And for more than 20 years, he was working for a wine company in this Rheingau area. And over a sudden, uh, there were some trouble at that winery with the investor. Da, la, la. Anyways, they changed the new management, changed uh, the labors, let's say. So he lost his job and also my company where I was working for, they got insolvent and uh, yeah, over a sudden we were like, okay. So you were facing as a family because you already had your two kids, yeah. you were facing a dramatic change in life yeah. because both of you lost their jobs. Yeah, We lost the jobs and also like um, part of this working contract from my husband's side was also our allocation. So we also had like to leave our house where we were living for plenty of time like 20 years almost so yeah it was a little difficult <laughs> this happened all in what kind of time uh, period within how many months or years uh, this was 2016 and it was in summer so in june and uh, yeah then we were hoping to find new jobs in that area because of, of if i may just jump in yeah, there how sorry. was it for you as a mother of two losing jobs f losing even the home how did you react how did you feel oh, helpless totally helpless and i mean also in that situation you really can figure out who's your friend and who's trying to help you i mean in that kind of situation it's difficult to help but i mean no one has enough space for hosting for people at the same time <laughs> and still okay uh, we had half a year for leaving the house, but my husband didn't touch any money after 20 years because it was a smaller company and they had less than 10 em employees. So there was not that German rule of getting some. I, uh, yeah, fa yeah, yeah. So. Um, so you yeah. might have even faced then financial challenges at that yeah, point sure. of time. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, when over a sudden you're losing the job, you don't know how it continues. What, what did do? you do? Because the thing. Um, no matter what it is, we can all relate that there are situations in life where you feel very down, where you think like, oh, f f <laughs> I didn't want to use the <laughs> F word, but you're, what does this mean here? Yeah. This, you said like helpless. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do to not being stuck into that, to not go into the sadness or even a depression or not moving on? What was here the driver you had to move on? Hmm. Good question. I was never thinking about it because when you have kids, you really have to be powerful. You have to just squeeze your popo. <laughs> so really like say, okay, I have to, to come over. I have to, to, to try to get in touch with all guys I ever had in this business, recreating network, saying, oh, we are doing this, that and those. Uh, if you hear something, please let us know. Think about so us. So you went into it activity yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean there was no space for any any depression i mean ne. In, in that yeah sure i mean sometimes it's it, as always you kind of you have to 
believe in even though it is at that moment really huge challenge you nevertheless have to believe that something better will come mm. and yeah indeed it came <laughs> but yeah it was really challenge i mean mm. kids so young the younger one was just in the first class at school the other one was in the fourth grade and not knowing where to go i mean yeah you're kind of lost really and this is not easy i can absolutely imagine <laughs> and still years after you are here and i have spoken to both of you to you and your husband yesterday and i can feel the love you have for armenia yeah. and how important that period in your life was for you to leave germany and to come here so what happened out of the situation being both without jobs losing your home what happened um one of the student colleagues or one of my of the colleagues of my husband when he started enology and viticulture was at that period already in Armenia and he was working here for the German International Corporation, GIZ. And he told us that at this um, EVN, so Yerevan Wine Academy, there is uh, a position uh, for teaching wine chemistry. And this was somehow in July that he offered or that he spoke about that. And we both, my husband and I, we were like, oh, no way, no way. I mean, where the heck is Armenia? And what should we do there we, what how about the kids so all the there was stuff. no relation ever to armenia right never ever <laughs> never ever i mean we are all armenian because of noah came here landed on ararat no ararat is the beautiful beautiful <laughs> volcano which is on um turkey uh turkey's part but you can still see it from from armenia you can pass it close to the border to turkey mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly so we are all to a certain kind of armenian i like that <laughs> <laughs> but still, you had no clue. Or you even said, like, where is Armenia, please? Yeah, yeah, really. We were totally, like, I mean, when you are growing in the Western German parts, you don't have any idea what's behind the, 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 the curtain. So, and, uh, yeah, so first we had to Google where Armenia is and what's about. And really, we had no idea. And first, also, we rejected. We said, no, no way that we are leaving the parents from my husband because they are way elder and uh, yeah however and then like i don't know in september or october this uh, colleague came once more and said hey this is still available there's still that announcement open from giz to leave the to to, to move to um, armenia as integrated expert meaning having a local working contract and getting kind of uh, financed by giz and at that point we were really like okay nothing else is working so let's just give it a try i will just apply for that job and if it is the right thing for us it will work or if not not something else will come so isabella you you again you went into action yeah mm -hmm. i mean without action it's difficult but sometimes it's really like easier just to sit and to wait until until something's falling from heaven but this is very seldom the case mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so then i applied and they were like gz wise they were really happy that they found someone <laughs> who were kind of uh yeah uh, able capable whatever to teach that not very easy topic and so it came that uh, i started with the preparation in january from so i think you came here first and yeah. your husband and your two kids came to armenia then later Right. And you have found this beautiful house. I was mm -hmm. astonished. It's so huge. And it even has a garden and the backyard and even a pool. And again, this beautiful terrace. So you said yourself, if I, if I may repeat that here in uh, more or less public, like this kind of life, it, it's different to Germany, but it would have not been possible uh, back home. Yeah. You said you have like a pearl who is coming and helping you back home <laughs> here. So it's a kind of... How would you describe your life here in comparison to... Is it easier? I mean, of course, it's, it's Armenia. It's different. New culture, new way of living. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, it sounds very sophisticated to say, oh, we have a pool and we have a big garden and we have someone who helps us our ways in the household. Um, on the other hand, I mean, we feel so more, way more relaxed here and we are just we feel like home i mean even though you can't differentiate i mean when you're walking this was my my my, my biggest trouble at the beginning not being able to read wherever i was walking i couldn't 
read what was written because Armenian they do have an own alphabet they have 20 uh, 38 different letters none is uh, comparable to what I ever saw <laughs> same for me <laughs> you are totally, totally lost. lost I mean totally lost and the, the guys of course they do see because blonde blue eyes they do see that you are not Armenian because you don't have black hair and black eyes and big nose let's say <laughs> but uh They all do approach you in Russian. And if you don't speak Russian or Armenian, then you are really lost. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this was not so the question. Tough, <laughs> yeah, there were, there, were, there were tough moments. At the same yeah. time, it helped you also to go on, to proceed, to learn new things, to expand yeah. what you are, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this was really like, for, for doing this kind of step, it's really, you really have to be brave. It's really mm. to come in a country not knowing, n not knowing anybody here i mean what really saved me how was old were you if i go in how old were you when you left germany uh oh god <laughs> 41 <laughs> and for your husband because he he's a bit older yeah right? he's 54 so it's or it's, 55 something like that yeah. yeah yeah so it's it's not obvious at that stage of life i mean we're not students anymore you know nee. with erasmus to travel around nee. europe and not at all and you have kids i mean also this is something that you have to to think not only twice but maybe fifth time five time more because you are not just taking the decisions for you mm. also like what will happen with your kids how will they deal with the situation being in the country i mean they they they, they were in germany the older one was in the fourth grade and he's just barely started speaking English and then here he had to both had to move to an English school without any English <laughs> almost <laughs> and then dealing with the situation of learning a foreign language from back scratch starting all the normal topics in English I mean for mathematics and art and music it works without language almost but for all the rest it's really a challenge literature whatever biology whatever they they have in class yeah so Really, my big, like, the, the guys that, that really saved me were exactly these young women that <laughs> Corinna met last lately <laughs> that brought us in touch with the German-Armenian husband because at that period... so they, I Our was connection, really, how yeah, we know our each connection, other. How, how we know each other is uh, thanks to Hazi and Onik. And uh, the first couple of months I have been living at their spot. So you had someone before your family arrived here where you could have... You support. found yourself sell a shelter, a support, yeah. and a new home. And they, as Onik is also German, he helped you to assimilate here. And he helped yeah. you most probably with that, some administrative stuff or cultural differences. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But still, um, those fears, of course, you're responsible for two kids. And you went into a country you before didn't even know where exactly it is located. How did you manage your fears then? You had the support, the external support, yes. But was there some key sentence that you said to yourself, like, okay, if it's not working, I can go back. Nothing is forever. Something like this. Was there anything that you s needed to... No, it was more the opposite. Like, I have to succeed. Ah. I am now the head of the family. Mm -hmm. I am the one that is working 100% because beforehand it was like a half, half time job. Um, and at that point, it was like, okay, now it's on my shoulder, it's on my responsibility. I am the one that is responsible mm -hmm. that the family can survive. Mm -hmm. So, because my, my, since my husband is older, for the German labor market, he's not interesting because he's too old, <laughs> overqualified and whatever. So it was really on my shoulders at that time. That's it's, a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it's a, it, yeah and, and that it, it was really like, okay, also to leave my kids, my husband for the first time, 4,000 kilometers far uh, at a place that I was like there for two weeks and then I left and I came here and they were over there and he was over a sudden also like he was the houseman he had to cook he had to wash he had to iron he had to purchase he had to bring the kids to school etc pipi so all this kind of stuff that he was not used at that extent mm -hmm. let's say mm -hmm. no. hmm. <laughs> to close that circle um, the differences, maybe you have two to three differences where you say, well, that's just really like a change to my life. Your current life here in Armenia to the one you had before in Germany. Oh, yeah. It's really upside down. It's, it's totally different. I mean, we, oh, it, we're all surrounded by, 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 by human beings. <laughs> 
but I don't know. I don't know how to how to describe. I mean, on one hand, we are at the spot where we are living. It's not where where you find very many other foreigners. Let's say so. It's because I've local. asked yesterday night. Yeah. So in this, we are close to the German embassy. Yeah, I passed it by car. It's I don't know one hundred meter. Uh, in that direction and I've asked how many German families do live here mm -hmm. and your two sons were present and they said like oh five actually five. which is not a lot right yeah. me myself I've been here now for a while I have not yet seen uh, one German except for you <laughs> and Arnie <laughs> yeah um, so it's not apparently there is not a very strong German community Yeah, I mean, there are some Germans, but I mean, we have a German Stammtisch, so this kind of me, yeah, at a German you brewery. You can always find it abroad, I like it. <laughs> yeah, in a German brewery, of course, once a month, but this is open, like, you, you, sometimes there are new guys coming there, sometimes there are guys that you saw one or two times, so sometimes they are just German-speaking, Armenian that have been living in Germany. So and I think this this was also what we said yesterday night that most of your friends are also Armenian even for your kids uh, yeah. ask with whom they are friends. And they said you're also uh, yeah in the international school where they are in it's of course a mixture different cultures different nationalities but good connection to the Armenians and I remember now because I think it was your husband who said yesterday or even you oh we have decided to go here and to live here which is like really a tricky little street and then another little tricky, tricky street to get here to your home. Um, whereas other expats do live a bit out of Cherevan. Mm -hmm. What is the area called that is typical expat here in Cherevan? Vahakni. This is also where the American school is based. Mm -hmm. And this is like 12 kilometers out of the center. And this is like they're mainly American are living the, there or like <laughs> Armenian oligarchs <laughs> mm -hmm. and also like all this expat community. So from plenty embassies, guys are living there like or from UN. Yeah, but we decided that this is not our piece of cake. We want to live where the normal people are living. I mean, what, whatever means normal, <laughs> but <laughs> where the local guys are living. And we have the little shop, so when something is miss missing, we're just sending the kids and say, okay, just jump into this little shop and grab whatever is needed, some fruits or a bottle of beer or some greens or whatever. So they have all everywhere these little shops in the streets where you can find all kind of stuff that is needed. And I mean, you can really like even at 11 o'clock in the night, you can walk here without any fear. There's nothing that will harm you. Maybe street dogs. But uh, besides that, I mean, this is really a safe, very safe country. Yeah, when so it comes to security, yeah. uh, I, I felt so comfortable here. Yeah. And yeah. people are so helpful. Yeah. They are so helpful. Yeah. Like when I was in Goris, um, I met a policeman. And after I went to buy my bottle of water because it was so hot, because it's also very hot here. <laughs> oh, yeah. And um, he came in and he said, no, he wants to pay for me. Yeah, of course, this is an exception. <laughs> and he knows <laughs> what he had in mind. The blue eyes. <laughs> most probably. But this is just like one, and it never happened to me before. And yeah. after... Not it was, without any... any. He didn't exception. show at least a second <laughs> thought in it. It was just like, here's your water. Yeah. Um, enjoy your stay test. high. Yeah. You stay here. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, when it comes to chair one, um, does it snow here? Eh, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, for the kids, it's always huge snow when we have five snowflakes. But um, it doesn't really get really cold. I mean, we have like, mm, this winter was a little colder. We had like minus eight, minus 10 for a couple of two weeks, three weeks maybe. But it's not really snowy here in Yerevan itself. Mm -hmm. It's more outside in the regions that you have held snow and also like minus 20, minus 25 degrees in this. And those minus just, degrees are might become a challenge then also when it comes to the wine yeah. uh, region, <laughs> right? So getting to the wine, you said, and now I need really you, you said like Armenia is very special because there are certain types of wines you cannot find out of Armenia. They are unique here. Yeah. And what is this crazy word you're <laughs> using for it? <laughs> <laughs> out of tone. Yeah. Uh, so out of tone grape variety. I have to unique. apologize. <laughs> Okay. I'm sure a lot of <laughs> listeners can know exactly what you're talking about. So it's kind of indigenous mm -hmm. or endemic grape varieties. So mm -hmm. this is really just something that you will find here. How many they different have, tastes are there? So they have like f approximately 400 different grape varieties. And out of them, like somehow 10% are really f for winemaking purposes. 
So is Armenia known for wine? Because while passing through Armenia, I saw certain wine routes. Yeah. And I was, oh, wow, wine. <laughs> This is such a mean question. <laughs> no one knows that Armenia has no, wine. <laughs> no bad thoughts behind. <laughs> <laughs> But um, maybe you passed also in Vajotsor through that nice valley and there is a little village called Areni, the same as yeah, is the grape variety. And there is Areni one cave. So this is a huge cave that they found 2010 randomly. And they figured out that this was kind of the first really like professional wine producing spot let's say so they have these uh, these karasi so these amphoras and you can see where the wine was kind of processed processed and how they managed to to make wine and uh, also they found some old leftovers and they made their dna analysis from the seeds and they figured out that this grape variety areni was already used at that time and that cave is 6200 years old And this is huge. Oh, wow. huge. <laughs> this is really like <laughs> so. Okay. I mean, uh, during this, uh, I, I know that it's not a proper um, <laughs> terminology, but I always use this uh, Soviet occupation from that country here. During that period, Armenia had as a plan economic goal to produce brandy and also fortified wines like Madeira and port wine, so this kind of stuff. So they were kind of not allowed to produce wine as wine. So this was Georgia. Georgia had mm -hmm. to produce wine and Armenia had to produce brandy and fortified wines. And uh, if I'm allowed to talk about the neighbor country, so Azerbaijan was kind of obliged to produce fruit juices. So that's why they lost a little this tradition of really like European or Western tongue suitable wine production. And this is something that they have to relearn or they had to relearn and they really did a great job uh, over the last 15 years with some big companies that established here and that bought land that grew vines, that made wines, international, like <laughs> suitable <laughs> wines. Uh, but still you have these very old Soviet companies and they are still producing this old Soviet style of stuff. And this is more difficult, more challenging. Yeah. What would be your approach to uplift the wine industry here in Armenia? We have spoken and discussed in the last couple of hours about the economy here, about the future in this really special area. Caucasus itself is a very challenging area. Um, there is still a kind of poverty also here in Armenia. So what do you view like some starting points again to uplift the wine industry in Armenia? So on one side you really must admit that they don't grow lots of wine that ends up as wine. So the main like they have approximately 20 so they don't have cadastra so it's not really sure how many vineyards they do have, what great varieties they do have because everyone is somehow somewhere putting some vine stocks somewhere and no one knows what grape varieties are growing, in fact. Anyway, so approximately 20, 25,000 hectares they do grow and some 4,000, maybe 4,500 hectares are really made for wine. So they really end up as wine, which is not much. I mean, Rheingau has 3,500 hectares. So and Rheingau is one of the smallest regions in Germany, <laughs> just to have a comparison. Um, what I see here is that you have mm, like s four different organizations in charge about wine, the young winemaker, Tritra Trulala and the old winemaker foundation and association and stuff. So there are so many groups and they are not really sitting at the same table for discussing the same topic. So everyone tries to be like oh but i did this and that research and the other one says no but i did this and that research beforehand Tralala. so they are not working together i mean f when we are such a tiny country with such a tiny wine production you really have to try to 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 sit at the same table and really to focus on what brings you 
like what pushes you towards the European market. And one thing for sure is also the wine law that they are creating and existing and also not, not only on paper existing, but also real uh, established wine law to follow certain rules and also to see or to check like, as for example, Ariani, how a typical Ariani should taste to have really like kind of a, also a standard yeah to have kind of a standard i mean that, that doesn't mean that uh, arini should always taste the same i mean pinot noir never tastes the same either so <laughs> but um, they really should try to have some like two or three out of tone grape varieties that they can really have like a label like to show case and say okay this is what is great in armenia so or just doing having this niche wine, wine stuff and really producing niche wines with these out of tone grape varieties or just showcasing two or three of these out of tone grape varieties and saying okay this is what tastes Armenia or what is the taste of Armenia mm, yeah so good points <laughs> to my ears as a not knower of the wine industry it sounds very reasonable last question for you what's your most favorite wine Oh, <laughs> such a classical question! I know you have been asked thousands of times. There, there, there is no, there is no answer for that because it's really sometimes the a wine that I would never drink on my own. I can't absolutely enjoy because the company around is amazing, or the landscape is amazing, or the, just the situation mm, gives that wine point. is great. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have like really like high expensive wine and you can't enjoy because the guys around you are stupid or whatever. So it's really so much depending on the situation that also like, is it winter? Is it summer? What mood do you have? So it's really, uh, yeah, I know that now it's wishy washy as we say in German. So it's really not a good answer, but there is no answer for that. I mean, if I would produce my own wine, I would say the best wine is the one that is already emptied <laughs> and sold at least. <laughs> yeah, but since I'm not producing wine yet, um, nee, it's really so depending on the situation. There is no standard replique on that question. <laughs> I like that as a response in general. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Isabel, I really enjoyed our talk. I learned a lot, I have to say, also during our, co our talk here right now. Of course, but also the time we spent together since yeah. yesterday. So thank you so much. <laughs> My dear listeners, stay tuned. This is a little special from Armenia. And if you feel like, subscribe, review, drop me a note, whatever. And um, is there any information about you we can provide and share? Do you have any, uh, any page? No. <laughs> There is nothing to share in that regard. But we stay tuned. I'm very curious how your life here continues. Yeah, thank you so And what much. the future book brings to you. Yeah, thank you thank so you much. So much. <laughs> in Armenian, we say kenats for uh, santé, so uh, prost. Kenats is the Armenian word for chin chin. And bari janapar, meaning having a good way wherever. So wherever the way leads us, bari janapar. <laughs> <laughs> 